title this morning as we wrap up this series through the book of Acts called Unstoppable. I chose those two songs right before my message on purpose because I, I see those as reflective of the Apostle Paul, that, that he was living this life just running home because uh, he firmly believed that heaven changes everything. And that colored everything that he did in life after he accepted Jesus and became a, a disciple, a follower of his. And, and as we wrap up this series in uh, the final parts of, of Acts chapter 28, that's where we'll be, we're thinking this is really an expose on how to develop an unstoppable faith and live an unstoppable life. And, and it's colored by one of the things that, that Paul would write to the church in Colossae. We know it as the, the book of Colossians in our Bibles. And in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul said this, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. In the book of Acts, chapter 28, we're going we're gonna to understand the context in which Paul wrote those words. But he reminds us there to set our hearts and our minds on heaven, where Christ is, and not on things of this world, not on this life. This was Paul's heart. This was Paul's mind. Uh, and, and, and we see this fleshed out through his life, through the book of Acts. And as it comes to a close in Acts 28, I want to draw some, uh, some lessons from it for us as far as what it means for us to follow in the footsteps of Christ and in the footsteps of his disciples. Uh, so if you, if you are, you consider yourself a disciple of Christ, you, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, I want you to understand that these are the footsteps in which we walk. If you haven't yet made up your mind yet, I, I want you just to listen, I want you to experience this, I want you to interact with us as we interact with God's Word. And notice the, the, the type of quality, the kind of character, the, the security, the peace, the purpose that life takes on when it's attached to Christ and his kingdom. As we recap, just to remind us where we've been and what got us to Acts chapter 28, the desire of Paul's life has been to go to Rome because Rome was the epicenter of the modern world and he wanted to go to Rome, to, in Paul's words, to, to, to preach in a place that, that didn't have a foundation yet laid. He, he wanted to be the first. He wanted to be the tip of the spear. And he wanted to go to Rome and tell them about Jesus. Now, he had written to Rome, and we have that in our Bibles too, known as the book of Romans, two years prior to what we see in Acts 28. So he's written to some Christians there. He wants to go and establish a, a work there. And it's been the desire of his heart uh, for, for most all of his believing life. He'll go there, though not how he planned to go there. He'll end up there, though not the way he thought he would get there. Have any of you ever ended up on a course you never saw yourself taken? Part of that course for Paul God orchestrated that to land him on an island called Malta. And in Acts 27 and 28, we read part of that story and how he got there. He was on a ship. He was arrested um, by the Jews in Jerusalem, and he appealed to Caesar because he was a Roman citizen. And every Roman citizen had the right to appeal their case to Caesar in Rome. So Caesar, like going to the Supreme Court. And so as a Roman citizen, he says, I appeal to Caesar. And so they had to, under law, because Rome was in charge of the legalities of, a, of, 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 of Jerusalem, he had to be put on a ship and taken to Rome where he would plead his case before Caesar. So he's on this ship going from Jerusalem, eventually headed to Rome. During that journey, the Bible tells us in Acts 27, 28, that they hit this storm. There's 276 people on board this ship, and the storm is so bad they can't fight against it. And they just have to let the ship go in, this, in the midst of the storm. They have no control over its destination. They have no control over what's going to happen. They're just trying to survive. Have any of you been caught there in a storm that you don't have any control over? 
You, you can't determine the direction. You're just, you're just along for the ride trying to survive. Well, that's where Paul is. And it ends up running aground and breaking apart. And they, they, they bear the treacherous seas on planks of boards, and, and they find themselves on the island of Malta. Now, it seems as though Malta was on God's agenda, but it wasn't on Paul's schedule. I know you've been there. Like, God, I didn't see this coming. There was no, this wasn't in my travel plan in this world. But you find yourselves washed up on Malta. And God did an incredible work with Paul on Malta. Acts 28, 1 through 10. You can read about it. We studied about it last week. It does, it does some incredible stuff on Malta. Stuff that, that, that God had in mind, but Paul didn't have in his plan. And, and, and they stay on Malta for about three months during the winter season. Um, and one of the, as, as, you, as you look at this time of Paul on Malta and what got him there, what got him there was this storm, right? They got him there was this horrific storm. Now, I have to ask myself, was the storm part of God's plan or was it part of the devil's plan? See, most of the things that we see in our life that are storms, that are treacherous, that are threatening, we don't see coming from the hand of God. We view that as, you know, the devil's attacking me, right? So which was it for Paul? Good, good, good answer. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, well, let me, just, let me just suggest this. It was probably both. Here's what I mean. God had it in his plan, his agenda, to reach the people of Malta. And he knew Paul was his guy to get him there. So though it wasn't part of Paul's plan, it was part of God's agenda. And so God used that storm to get him there. One of the greatest revivals we have in history happened on Malta because of Paul's shipwreck there. It was incredible what God did, but Paul was there for three months. So we could say the storm was part of God's plan to get Paul to Malta because it was not on Paul's agenda. However, we could also say it was part of the devil's work to destroy Paul and the work of God. That's been the devil's work from the beginning. The devil's tried to, to disrupt the line of the Messiah from the very beginning. The, the, the Bible says that the work of the evil one is to steal, kill, and destroy. He certainly did not want Paul getting to Malta to tell people about Jesus. So it could have been both. Here's one of the ways you know which, which it is. Storms are used by God to employ us, and storms are used by the devil to destroy us. And so part of it depends on how we respond. The, the greatest example of this is the cross of Jesus. At the cross of Jesus, the devil thought he'd won. It was a work of evil to destroy the body of Christ. And I guarantee you, on that evening where Jesus breathed his last, the devil thought, finally, I've been trying to get this guy to stop since before he was born. It didn't work in the wilderness. <laughs> now I got it. it. Fine, I got him. Only to find out that Sunday was coming. When God said, devil, that cross was not the work of you to destroy my son. That cross was the work of me to enter into humanity's salvation. Do you understand that? It's interesting. When you look at the book of James, and we're going to start the book of James next week. In chapter 1, verse 2, James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, pins these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that those trials test your faith and it makes you persevere. The interesting thing about what James writes, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, it's the same word that's also translated temptation. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face temptations. It's the exact same Greek word. It can be, and some versions of the Bible translate as temptations, not trials. One is given to us by God, trials to employ us. One is given to us by the devil, temptations to destroy us. The Bible says consider pure joy, whichever it is. 
Because you know that through trials and temptations, your faith is tested. And when your faith is proven, it produces perseverance and perseverance, faith, and all those things God wants to do. So this storm, meant to employ Paul or destroy Paul? Both. And so, because Paul is walking with God and listening to God in the direction of God, it ends up being for his employment of God. And they wash upon this island of Malta. And verse 11 of Acts 28, we pick up the story. And it says this, after three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. So we know this is Malta. After He spent three months there after the winter's gone. Uh, And they set out to sea. They're still on their journey to get there. I haven't got there yet. This journey is going to take Paul six months to get there from the time he left Jerusalem to finally get to Rome. So they spent three months on Malta. They continue their journey. Uh, They're going to get there eventually. They pick up their journey now. And this is what verse 14 and 15 say. We came to Rome. The brothers there heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Isn't it amazing how when the right people get around you, it lifts you? Isn't that amazing how that happens? Like, like we've all been there when we're, we're just at those really, really low points in life, and the wrong person shows up, and you're like, I can't, man, I can't. and then family leaves, and you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, uh, we're also at those other points of life when we're, we're, it's the same low points. You're just like, I don't know if I can get up this morning. And you do, you muster the strength, and then the right person comes into your world. The right person sends a text, a note, a phone call, an invitation. And you're just like, I I can breathe again, right? And so that's what these men were for Paul. And it's interesting. Some, some, the Bible says, come from the form of Apius and some from the three taverns. What what Luke is telling us is that they came from various different um, places to come meet him. Some traveled a very short distance, some a very long distance. Because Paul was important to them. And seeing the effort that they went through to show up, Paul was encouraged. And it it, it reminds me of what what the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17. It says, there are some friends and brothers who are born for adversity. There are some people, we need those type of people in our life, who it feels like they're born to bear our adversity. You, You know what it's like to go through adversity and difficulty and hardship alone. And you know what it's like to have someone come up underneath you. It's like they're born to bear that adversity with you, right? And it just lifts you. And that's what these guys were for Paul. So let me set the stage. So they're in Rome. And verse 16 says, When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself, and here's a little asterisk, with a soldier to guard him. What was happening here uh, under uh, arrest in Rome, he was arrested, but he wasn't convicted. And so he was allowed to live under house arrest and rent a house in Rome and have complete freedom as long as he was in that house with the caveat of having a soldier chained to him 24 hours a day. There were four soldiers, six-hour shifts. One would do their six hours, another soldier would come in and relieve him and do their six hours and on and on around the clock. So he wasn't convicted, but he was still arrested. Under house arrest, they had a lot of liberty, but he was still incarcerated in that house. Now, in Rome at this time, there were a couple million people, and it was really dirty. It was a nasty place to live. Half the people there were slaves and prisoners. The other half were Romans and uh, citizens and and soldiers. And, And it didn't have a bunch of beautiful architecture. It was a pretty dingy, nasty place. So Paul is allowed to live in this rented, nasty little home, but at least have freedom. He's not in a jail cell. Uh, and, 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 and he has these guards around him all the time. And so that's where he is. And so it's in that context I want to go through the rest of this chapter and draw out some things that he wrote from this context to Christians in other churches. Now, now look at what he says in verse 17 and 20. Three days later, he called together, Paul called together the Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, Although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. It's because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. I I can just imagine him sitting there 
chained to a Roman guard. He calls, he calls the, the Jewish leaders in Rome together because he wants to talk to them. And I love the fact that it says, after three days. So he gets to Rome after this six-month trip, after this harrowing experience on sea. He finally gets to Rome. He takes three days to settle in, to get his house in order, and, and to get the word out for guys to meet him. He takes three days. In other words, he doesn't take long. He doesn't take a little siesta because it's been a really hard trip. He doesn't say, I just need some me time. And I feel like for my own emotional well-being. You know what I'm saying? He's like, we got work to do. I ain't going to slow down. Who's taking their foot off the accelerator? Like the best thing for me is to get busy. And so three days, he invites all these guys over. And he says, look, I just want you to understand, I've done nothing against our people I've done nothing against the, the, the traditions of our people. And I don't hold anything against our people. He said, I'm not bringing a charge against our people, against our brethren. I'm just, this is just part of the, of the course. I appeal to Rome, so I'm here. I just want to set this record straight why I'm here. The reason I'm here is because of these chains, the hope of Israel. And I can just imagine him going, because of these chains. And this Roman soldier being like, go oh, Okay, Paul, dramatic and all. And he says, look at the hope of Israel. That's why I mean. I love the fact that Paul understood what he wrote two years, uh, 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 well, he would write to the church that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against authorities and, and, and powers of this dark world. He didn't blame his fellow Jews. He didn't blame the religious establishment. He didn't blame the Romans. He didn't blame the system. He didn't blame the politics. He didn't blame the politicians. He didn't blame the leadership. You understand that? He said, I'm here because of the chains of the hope of Israel. It's our same hope. It's Titus 2.13. It says, our blessed hope is the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, that's why I'm here. That's the impetus of this whole thing. The life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. It's so interesting to me that, that though he's incarcerated, he believes, and I believe with him, he's in the center of God's will. When he was in the storm, he was in the center of God's will. When he's incarcerated, he's in the center of God's will. And one of the reasons I believe he's in the center of God's will, because it's during this incarceration that we have the letters that he wrote. They're called the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. It was during this incarceration this house arrest that he wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote to the church in Philippi. He wrote to the church in Colossae, and he wrote to his friend Philemon. The chain, neither chains nor house arrest would ever hinder Paul's mission for God in the world. He didn't, he didn't bemoan the chains. The chains were his liberation to continue the work of God in his world. And, and, and I, I look at the, as we've seen the church in Scripture, why the church in Scripture has been so unstoppable and why the testimony and the witness of the church and of Paul so powerful. And why does it seem the church in our day and age seems to be so weak and ineffectual? And I, I think we start to understand why when we start to look at, at, at Paul's heart. And his desire, while chained to this Roman soldier in this context, I want you to see what he says. He writes this while chained to the soldier in this context. This is what he writes uh, from Colossians 4. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearlessly as I should. Be wise in the way, look at what he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Who's he chained to? A Roman guard, an outsider. Look what he says, be wise in how you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity, even the chains. Let your conversations that they hear be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may, so that you may know how to answer everyone. He's saying that chained to a Roman guard under carceration. It's amazing to me. 
Here's one of the reasons I think we see such a difference in the church we see in Scripture and, and what we experience today. Um, it's because while we pray for freedom, Paul prayed for a witness. You understand? Paul says, oh, no, no, believe me, I want an open door. But I want an open door to preach the message. I don't need an open door to my freedom. You understand? I'm going to stop him. And maybe this is one reason why the church we see in the Bible is so vastly different from the churches we see today. We get so concerned about our freedom. And Paul said, the only open door I need, matter of fact, I want you to pray for me that I have an open door to talk about Jesus. And that happened through his chains, not his liberation. You all right? So these men arrived and to meet with Paul on a certain day. And they came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. And he witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. This was a Bible study. This would have been an awesome Bible study. John, you and I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that Bible study. We wouldn't have said much. Or you wouldn't have said much. I'd open my mouth and put my foot in it a couple of times. But, but this wasn't some Bible study at a, co- a coffee shop, you know, with fountains and, and food trucks. This was in this little dingy rented house. And this wasn't one of those that went an hour, maybe an hour 15, and the people were gracious and didn't complain too much about sitting too long. <laughs> this, was, this was anywhere, typically these things lasted 10 to 12 hours. It was an all-day thing, and they would teach... And there would be questions and corrections and more teaching and then more questions and then corrections and more teaching and questions and corrections and more teaching. 10 to 12 hours. And I love the fact that this was out of the house where Paul was. Paul didn't need an office. He didn't need a campus. He didn't need a coffee shop. He didn't need... Wherever Paul was was the home base of his ministry. His home was the home base of his ministry. There's a lesson there for us. I want you to consider, you who say, who, who claim Jesus, who, who claim to, to be a disciple, I want you to, I want you, I want to challenge you. Your home could become the base of operations to spread the kingdom of God. Your home. Not the church building. I know for, for, for Shell and I, when we first moved to the ranchos, it was really important to us that our home be the home base uh, for the, the mission of God in the ranchos. I mean, one of the things we did when we first showed up here, we had about 40 junior hires. Uh, Miranda, you, you were part of that first group. Where, where, did, where, did we, where did you guys meet as junior hires when we first showed up? In my detached garage. Because it was a home base of our ministry. And from there, we tried to reach the ranchos. There's kids in this church. Kaylee leading our children's ministry and her husband, Sean. Out of that little detached garage, his little junior hires. Where my son met his wife. Eventually, not in junior high. <laughs> when I started coaching our way of football, we moved our junior high ministry to Monday nights. Because Monday was the day we didn't have football practice. We had football practice Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Colton, you remember this. You're part of this little group. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then games on uh, high school Friday, and then youth games on Saturday. And so we moved our youth ministry to Monday nights, and here's why. Because though we didn't have practice on Monday nights, I started doing, what do we do at my house every Monday night, Colton? Watching films. And Shel- it was voluntary, and Shelly would make a big meal for everybody. Remember, Colton? 
Big meal for everybody, all the players, coaches, and everything. And they all come over to my house, and we'd watch films of our previous game and films of our upcoming opponent. We'd eat together, we'd watch films together, and we would end just before youth group started. And we'd tell all the kids, any of you want to go to youth group, pile in. And we had parents that would drive all these kids to junior high youth ministry on Monday night. Because our home was the home base of our ministry. And we used it that way. You understand that? So we took that detached garage and converted it into a two-bedroom house. And we're going to rent it for traveling nurses or whomever. But you know what my number one prayer is over that thing every day? That God will send us someone, not who can pay us to use it, but God will send us someone who doesn't know him that will have a witness to them so he, they will accept him. It's the home base of our ministry. So let me just tell you, whether you have a rented house, a purchased house, a trailer, or a tent, if you're a disciple of Christ, I want you to start viewing that as your home base for the work of God in your world. View it as that. Have the expectation of that. And use it as that. It's a resource. And while Paul's meeting with these guys, the Bible says some were convinced by what he said, but others what? Would not believe. Some are convinced, many aren't. It reminds me of Jesus' parable of the sower. He says the sower goes out and scatters seed. Just ever throws a seed. It's the word of God. Just throws it out there. Throws the word of God out there. And, and then the parable, three quarters of that seed doesn't really produce anything. Only one quarter of it does. And, and even that that produces is different varying in amounts and, and time frames. But three quarters of it, some of it's just rejected right off the bat. They don't give it any, any, any validity at all. Some of it's initially accepted, but then, they, you know, life happens and worries and stresses and desires and just kind of chokes it out. And, and here's what I know. That there, that there simply, there has to be joy in the witness not just in the production. Because if the parable of Jesus is applied to us, if, if Paul's experience is applied to us, when we share Jesus with our huddle, some will believe. And a lot may not. If Paul didn't even bat a thousand, if, 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 you understand what I'm saying? Not everybody believed what he said. He was okay with that. Because there was joy in the witness. There was joy in the mission. And for Paul, as he's looking at all of this, he says all of this happened for one reason, to advance the kingdom, to advance the gospel. It was kingdom above all. In this context, he writes to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 1. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, all this stuff that we've learned that's happened to me, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear that throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ, he said, this has all been so good. The arrest, the shipwreck, the storms, the incarceration. It's been so good because everybody's learned that I'm in chains because of the gospel of Christ. He's writing this from, the, from house arrest in Rome. And when he says it's become clear to the whole palace guard, the soldiers that were attached to Paul were the emperor's elite guards. They were, they were called the, the, the Praetorian guards. And they're stuck with Paul six in six-hour shifts. And see, what Paul understood, though he, though he was the one who was at, in captivity, it was the soldiers who were chained. Through his captivity, Paul had a captive audience. And they had to listen to everything he said. They were forced to listen to the message of Christ over and over and over again. I love the fact that Paul didn't complain about the injustice. He didn't bemoan the fact of the liberties that he had lost. He didn't decry the outrage over his own brethren and the bogus trials he had faced before Caesar Nero. He didn't complain about any of that. He didn't complain that he couldn't go down to the grocery store anymore. He didn't complain about the social distance he had to keep from everybody else because he was incarcerated and sh shuddered in his home. He didn't complain about any of that.
And as a result, at the end of this letter he wrote to, to the Philippian church, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters are with me, send their greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to whose? Caesar's household. Now, how did people in Caesar's household accept Jesus as their Savior? Because the guards who were guarding Paul, who couldn't get away from his witness and testimony because his speech was seasoned with salt and full of grace, talking about the message and the cross of Christ, they accepted Jesus as their Savior. They couldn't deny it any longer. And they went home and told their families, and their families accepted Christ. And now Caesar's household is coming to faith. Set your heart and minds on heaven, where Christ is seated, not on earthly things. This is why it's unstoppable. I love that about Paul. See, the chains that bound Paul didn't bind God's word. Those chains unleashed God's word. God's word and witness would have never been unleashed had it not been the chains that bound Paul. What are you chained to? That up until this point, you've been scared of. What have you been chained to? That until this point, you've been bitter about. What are you chained to? That up until this point has been your fear and your discouragement and your frustration. Consider. Your chains could be the thing that unleashes Jesus' story to your huddle. Your chains, the pain that you're chained to, the illness you're chained to, the problems, do those chains produce this type of kingdom impact? Do those chains in your life produce this type of kingdom productivity? If not, why? Here's why. Because we want freedom from difficulty. Paul wanted the opportunity to witness. And sometimes that witness comes through the chains. All Paul said was, look, don't, don't pray for an open door for me to get out. Don't pray that these chains fall off. See, those types of worship songs sell really well in church. Break the chains, Lord. Set us free, Lord. Those make great worship songs. And worship songs that are like from Paul's life don't sell real well. Keep the chains, give me a witness. And this is why I think what we see in the Bible is so unstoppable. And perhaps why some churches today are so anemic. Because we're all about liberation and freedom. Paul was all about the witness. We just look at the couple last verses here, verse 30. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who would come to see him. So in all, the last four years of Paul's life, Paul was under arrest. Two years in Caesarea, two years in Rome. The last four years of his life, he was bound in chains, and under arrest. But I want you to notice, this, this is what's significant. Don't miss this. Whenever we read the Bible, we read it for what it says, but we read it also through spiritual eyes. I ask the students all the time on Monday and Wednesday night, what did it say, and how do you read it spiritually? What do you understand spiritually about this? One of my sons is going through this transition in his life of, of jobs and waiting on God and all this stuff, and and I just asked him the other day, I said, I said, what have you learned spiritually in this time? Just, let's just think spiritual. So watch this. The last four years of Paul's life, he's chained. He's under arrest. The longest period of Paul's incarceration was the greatest period of Paul's impact. We can learn spiritually from that. See, God's assignment was Paul's confinement. The times of your greatest pain, the times of your greatest challenge, 
the times of your greatest problem, the times of your greatest frustration, could be the times of the greatest impact on your huddle. Do you understand? See, Paul saw everything in his life as an opportunity to tell Jesus a story. He's like, the shipwreck, didn't see that coming. What an opportunity. The snake bite on Malta, didn't see that coming. What an incredible opportunity. These chains, didn't want that. What an opportunity. This incarceration, didn't plan on that. What an opportunity. Because it's not about my freedom and liberation. It's about the kingdom and the message of Christ. Because my mind and my heart are set on things above where Christ is seated. So, Father, if it's chains, just open a door for me to talk about you. So here's the thing. Whatever you're chained to, that is your opportunity to tell the message of Jesus. Do you understand? There's nothing wrong with praying that chains break. There's nothing wrong at all. Matter of fact, the church prayed a lot for that when, or in the early days when, when its people would get arrested. And chains broke and doors opened and people were free. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But, but I'm saying, understand that those chains can also be your greatest opportunity for the greatest impact on your huddle. The book ends really oddly. It ends in, 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 in chapter 28, verse 31. It's given all this detail. Look at how it ends. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The end. You've been so detailed up to this point. I mean, you told us what the ship looked like, the, the ports it ported it, like how deep the soundings were taken during this. Like you've been so, and then all of a sudden, yeah, he talked about Jesus, and he was really bold, and he wasn't hindered by anything. And it's all, some people think that the last part of Luke's writing got lost somewhere. We just lost it. We don't know how it ended. And because it ended so weird in verse 30, they said, someone write something to put a period on this thing. And some, some scribe just came up with this stuff. I don't know if it went down like that. I, I think the Holy Spirit chose for it to end like this. Because though the book of Acts in the Bible has 28 chapters, I think that it was written like this, ended like this, because he's invited us into the story. You and I are chapter 29, and chapter 30, and chapter 31, and chapter 32, and chapter 33, and chapters 333. This book's still being written about God's unstoppable church his unstoppable disciples. And so the question I have to ask is this. How will you write your chapter? What is going to be the impact that will be written about your story in your chapter? Will your life be part of the unstoppable story? And if so, how? Because we're not told what happened to Paul, we got to wonder how it all came to an end. What happened? And we know from two men, Clement and Eusebius, who wrote around 80 AD, that Paul was released from this house arrest for about a year, only to be rearrested for a second imprisonment in Rome and then beheaded. And so during that last year where he had, a, we had freedom before he was rearrested, this is what I think went down from based on what we know from his writing. I think he first went to Colossae uh, where he met with Philemon. Philemon, and, and we have that letter that he wrote, would write to Philemon about this guy named Onesimus. Onesimus was Philemon's slave, and Onesimus escaped and went down to Rome where he met an old Paul and accepted Christ there. And Paul is writing to Philemon to say, look, Onesimus, your former slave, has become a brother in Christ. Treat him as such. 
and when I go see you, prepare a room for me. So when we know that Paul was planning on going to see Philemon and Onesimus and help reconcile that relationship in Colossae. And after Colossae, he went down to Crete. And we believe that he met with the, with the, the churches there and, and, and told Titus to raise up leaders in the city. He was concerned about the church leadership there, and he did some coaching there. And after there, we think he probably went to Ephesus, where he met one more time with Timothy, his young protege. Uh, and it was, it was from Ephesus that we know from history that he went back to Troas. And, and, and history tells us that it was at Troas that he was rearrested by the Roman authorities um, and taken back to Rome where he would stand the second trial before Caesar Nero. And it was after that trial when he was convicted, uh, found guilty of whatever they wanted to charge him with and sentenced to death that the Apostle Paul wrote these words. And this is some of the last words that we have of him. Already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. Finish the race. And through it all, I kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. What a great day that's going to be. And not only to me, but for all who've longed for his appearing. And history tells us that he was taken to the uh, Mamertine prison. And that was his jail cell where he wrote those words to Timothy. My day's coming. It's going to be soon. And I'm ready. There was a hole in the ground. And above that jail cell was the floor where the soldiers would walk back and forth and drop food down to him. And there was no light. It was cold. It was dark. He was all alone. And it's there that he wrote to Timothy, I'm ready. I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. All I wanted was an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. I got it. And it's from this jail cell that he'd be taken to stand before Nero, and he would hear the words of the sentence, death sentence read to him. And he was taken to the Apian Way, and it was there that they severed his head from his body. And he went in that instant from the imperial city of Rome to the eternal city of heaven. And it was there in that instant that the crown that had been laid up for him, the crown of righteousness, was given to the Apostle Paul. You see, the longer we walk with Jesus, the more trials we go through, the more scars we bear on our body, the more hardships we experience, the more suffering we, we experience, are all meant to shape and mold us into the image of Christ and to prove that we belong to the scarred one who for our transgressions and sins bore our iniquity. It was all placed on him and by his stripes, the scarred one, we're healed. So that finally, if you are in Christ and remain in him, you too, on that one glorious day, will receive from the hand of the Father the crown that has been set aside for you, the crown of righteousness given to you by the righteous judge. If you finish the race. Why do we do it? Why did the first church do it? Why did Paul do it? One reason. We do it for the eternal kingdom, which is our sole focus. Unstoppable. Setting our minds on things above. We run with endurance the race before us. 
and we run toward our eternal home with Jesus. Because we're convinced that heaven changes everything. And so we endure anything to tell the story of Jesus. The unstoppable team. And friends, I implore you in the name of Jesus to be unstoppable. Kingdom above all. I want you to pray with me. Just think for a moment. Just, just kind of listen. The book of Acts has been encouraging and convicting both at the same time because that's what the Word of God does. It encourages our hearts. It infuses us with energy and it also convicts us. It's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's what the Holy Spirit does. And some of us in this morning are encouraged. Like, yes. Like that heart of Paul. That, that's what I want. Yes. And some of us are convicted. Because if, we, if we're honest, we have to say, God, I don't want to change. I don't care about it. Like, honestly, if I got to choose one over the other, I want freedom and healing and liberation, and you can handle your kingdom. <laughs> and it really causes us to assess. And so I think both of those things are going on right now in hearts. And I want to encourage you. This kingdom of God is eternal and lasting. And everything in this world is passing. And we can only serve one of them. And I want to invite you into this kingdom and re invite you into your commitment, your unstoppable commitment to this kingdom. I want to invite you in this moment between you and God just to say something. In your own words, he, he just cares about your heart. He doesn't care about my words. I just want to lead you a little bit. And say, God, I, I want to be a part of your kingdom. Jesus, thank you that you love me. You died on the cross for me. And you deserve all my life, all my commitment, all my passion, all my energy. I give it to you. Make me new. I don't like the old me. I want a new me. I invite you into my life, Jesus, and make me new. I accept your forgiveness. Thank you. Others of you, you, you've already done that, but I'm telling you, you know, you feel it right now. Unstoppable? That's not you. And it may be in this time that you say, Father, I'm I just confess and I admit that the agenda of my life has been about a lot of things other than your kingdom. And I confess that to you. I admit it. And today I'm coming home. Use all of me. And if, if, if you want to chain me to something so I have the opportunity to tell your story, go ahead. If you want to liberate me from something so I have the opportunity to tell your story, go ahead. I just want to tell your story. Best I know how. I give you my full self. Father, I thank you that you love us so much so that you gave your son that any of us who would believe in Jesus would have eternal life. Thank you that we can pass from this world into the next. Thank you that we can pass from death to life. 
Thank you for the unstoppable kingdom that you've invited us into. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would ignite hearts, that you would ignite lives, that you would turn lives towards your kingdom, towards your things, completely sold out, completely committed, repentance and failure and anxious to obedience, in love with you and your word. That you continue your unstoppable kingdom through us. That, that's our desire, God. That's our desire. However you want to do that, that's our desire. God, ignite hearts. Ignite lives. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Listen, here, here's what I'm going to ask. I want you to come back next week. We're going to start the book of James. And the James is super practical. It's like super practical. Written by the half-brother Jesus. Okay, now if you say you believe, like here's practically how you do this. Um, and and um, someone told me recently, they said, like, can you just do something happy on Sundays? <laughs> Heaven's happy. <laughs> Getting there might not be happy, but <laughs> Heaven's happy. Uh, but James is one of those where it's like, okay, I, got, I, can, I, can, I can do this. Like this is, I got, I got it. Nobody dies in the book of James. It's going to be a good study. And it's going to flesh out everything that we saw in Acts. It's going to kind of flesh that out in real terms. Like, this is how we do this. And I want, I want to invite you back to that. So, so make sure you, you come back for that. But here's how we're going to wrap this up. I, I feel like this can't be one of those, hey, we're going to sing a song, just loves you, have a great week, get out. I, I feel like we've got to do it a little bit differently. And I don't want to manipulate anything. I don't want to make anybody feel weird. But at the same time, it's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to be significant. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song, anthem, right? Jesus is the anthem of our soul, the anthem of our lives, his kingdom. Um, and so I want you guys to sing. We're just going to, for a time, we're just going to, we're just going to sit and soak. Okay. Sometime during this song, when you're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm ready. Like, it's going to be new. Either a new faith or a new commitment. Like, I'm ready. Unstoppable. When it feels like that inside, as a bodily expression of that, I just want you to stand up and sing loud. But just don't jump up and, like, not think about it. Like, just soak a little bit and then make your statement. But if some of you aren't ready for that statement, I get it. Believe me, I get it. I just want you to be in the presence of this a little bit longer. Come back next week and discover, like, practically, what does this stuff mean? Can I commit to this? And just, just be for a moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I love you. I love opening up the Bible with you. It's so good. Let's keep doing it. Let's just set like an every, let's say every week.